No, welcome back to our dry bean webinar series hosted through the University of Vermont and Cornell University and supported by Northeast SARE. I always appreciate SARE's investment in our various projects. They're a great funding organization and really um, have been wonderful to work with, supported a lot of our work here in Vermont and of course at Cornell. <clears throat> I'm joined today by my colleagues here at UVM, Ivy Krasinski and Susan Brulette. That um, I know a lot of people know Susan. She helps coordinate all of our outreach. And Ivy is a research specialist here and working on dry beans, amongst other things. And our um, collaborators at Cornell University and Kristen Loria is joining us today and is part of uh, Matt Ryan's program at Cornell University. And again, we've been fortunate enough to be funded through Northeast SARE <clears throat> to continue our work in dry bean production here in, in the Northeast. Um, and we are joined by Scott Bales today from Michigan State, and he's gonna be talking to us about the kind of basics of growing dry beans. And so we'll uh, turn it over to him in a minute, but I did wanna talk a, a little bit quickly about um, our Northeast SARE project. So you get a sense of what we're gonna be doing over the next few years. Okay, so the Northeast SARE project, um, our goal is to continue to try and expand um, organic dry bean production and dry bean production in general in the Northeast. We wanna just um, create more opportunities for farmers to get together that are interested in growing dry beans and those that are already growing to share information. And we're also conducting some various research practices or research projects to uh, try to develop a baseline of agronomic practices here in the Northeast. So next slide, please, Ivy. All right, so again, the goals, just really wanna connect farmers around dry bean production, facilitating knowledge exchange amongst each other, learning from each other and uh, working with farmers to help answer questions, research questions, and then again, share that uh, amongst <clears throat> all of our stakeholders. Next question, please. And we are conducting some research, mostly looking at varieties uh, amongst a whole bunch of different uh, market classes. And then we're also looking at seeding rates um, of black beans in particular and their performance in tilled and no-till systems, uh, specifically looking at rolling and crimping rye and planting black beans in, into those. And again, looking at tilled versus organic um, no-till systems. So as the, you can go to the, oh, no, it's already here. As the research becomes available, we'll continue to uh, get you access to that. And our first research report was posted a couple of weeks ago um, to highlight the results from the dry bean trial. And you can see we trialed a number of different types of beans, um, you know, from heirlooms to, you know, kind of standard, more standard types and varieties. So in some ways it's comparing apples to oranges, but we put them all together in one trial and present the data together. And again, the data is available on our website at this point, and we'll continue to post um, research results as we get them processed. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining us for the second webinar. It looks like we have um, poll results up, so that's exciting. Lots of farmers in the room as well as research and extension. And yeah, Scott is an extension specialist with us um, from Michigan State. So um, we're you know really impressed by uh, the breadth of Michigan's dry bean research. They have a great a great network of farmers and a great network of research and extension. So. Uh, we're very excited to to have Scott with us. So I'll hand it over to you, Scott. Thank you very much for that introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share screen here. 
And then my next move is to start my timer because I will run right through this time if I don't put a limit on it. <laughs> All right, so thank you for that introduction. Uh, once again, my name is Scott Bales, uh, a dry bean uh, specialist from Michigan State University uh, based here in the Thumb in Saginaw Valley. Um, and today we're really gonna try to focus on the basics of dry bean production. Um, given the amount of time, we will go into a little bit uh, more of some of our research findings you know, around these basics of production, uh, but it should be a hopefully an enlightful talk today. And I'll just give a little bit more of an introduction about myself. Uh, my name is Scott Bales. I work for the Michigan State University College of Ag and Natural Resources, specifically within the Department of Plant and Microbial Sciences. Uh, my current appointment here is 50% research and 50% extension. So I spend half the year, you know, working on dry beans and very applied type issues in the fields with our farmers. And the other half of the time I spend telling people about it like we're doing here today. Um, I like to say my focus is really in sustainability. Um, and I kind of have that twofold, both, you know, environmental and economic, because uh, I believe those two are are one together for our growers. You know, things that we do that are, are good for our sustainable environment are also good for the long long-term, you know, economic sustainability of our farms. You know, most of our farms here, like New York and Vermont, you know, we're generational farms, you know, and we're all about leaving those in, in better shape than we found them. And, and through that, a lot of my focus is on, you know, genetic testing and improvement. Uh, we ran 13 different locations of variety trials last year with both public and private breeders. Um, but then also we work a lot on, you know, improving production practices, you know, so looking at different tillage programs, looking at row widths, seeding rates, um, things like that to, to overall improve our production. So, you know, I say my uh, appointment is 50% extension. So at a grower meeting last year, I tried something new. Um, and, and that's always scary in extension when you have a room full of growers, you never know what somebody's going to say. Uh, and this one, it was interesting. So I, I started going around the room like you would at a wedding, you know, asking how long people have been married, except I was asking them how long they've been growing dry beans. You know, you start at 20 years, you go to 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. And we had two growers that have been growing dry beans for longer than 60 years and we're still actively growing dry beans in the state of Michigan. So I asked those two, I said, what advice do you guys have for a new dry bean grower? You know, and how do we, you know, keep them a dry bean grower and stay a lifelong grower? So that way in 60 years from now, they're still raising dry beans. And almost like it was on cue, they both jokingly answered, know your crop insurance salesman very well because you're going to need him. <laughs> and, and we laugh and it, it's fun, but, a big part of what I do, I think, is to help mitigate that risk and associated risk that there is with dry bean production. Um, and we can really talk about a lot of that with the basics of production. You know, foundation of our, our program for the year can really help mitigate some of those risks and have us be as prepared as possible as we head into each season um, to keep those guys lifelong growers. Because um, without that foundation, they would not be. Um, so we'll kind of outline, you know, what we'll go through today, you know, to talk about, you know, how to mitigate that risk along these basics. You know, and we'll start with some basic infrastructure. I'll move into genetics, you know, some background and also some tools for selection. Uh, basic agronomics of dry beans, you know, planting rates, row widths, those things that we discussed. Uh, fertility and nutrient management, uh, also weed control, disease suppression, harvest aids, and also, you know, kind of bringing everything home. Um, the majority of my research does take place in conventional systems, uh, but we do work with organic dry bean growers as well. Uh, we actually just had breakfast with a, an organic grower here this morning talking about some production challenges. Um, and looking through that data, Michigan had 15,000 acres of organic dry bean production um, the last time that was surveyed by USDA. So that definitely does play a, a significant role in our, our systems here when we're an, on average uh, 200 to 230,000 acre state uh, for dry bean production. So when we talk about infrastructure, you know, the biggest things that, that I see from a strictly dry bean perspective, you know, is going to be, you know, our drainage, our compaction and taking care of our headlands. You know, this picture here is something that's all too common, you know, after a heavy rain um, in our dry bean fields, you know, that those areas of compaction um, and, and poor drainage really show up uh, in our dry bean crops. You know, we can see this across soybeans, corn, you know, sugar beets, et cetera, uh, but dry beans are the ones that are most prone to, you know, what growers will call wet feet um, when we start to have those root diseases set in and actually lose portions of that crop. You know, and one thing that, that really we have seen that helps with this, you know, is 
A, taking care of compaction, you know, cover crops, you know, things like that, doing the right things, uh, but also looking at drainage. When we talk about tile drainage here in the state, um, we uh, have really proactively tiled the dry bean production region of the state. You know, you can see here on our last USDA census, um, if you look at the counties in Michigan that are heavily tiled, uh, it's right in that Thumb and Saginaw Valley region. Um, and I do believe that is something that has really helped us mitigate some of that risk in dry bean production, um, is being able to keep that soil from being, you know, saturated uh, with our dry bean crops. So we'll move on to variety selection. Obviously, not too much to share there on infrastructure because uh, we know there's some serious limiting factors there at times too. Uh, but you know, the first thing I think of in variety selection is we need to know our growth type and market class of interest. Um, here in the state of Michigan, you know, we're, we kind of separate these into two groups. You know, we have determinants, you know, or bush type beans. You know, most often these are our kidney types. You know, light red kidney, dark red kidney. You know, I've seen some of those heirloom varieties like Jacob cattle um, and some of these things, and also cranberry beans. Uh, they're more of a determinant bush type plant um, that kind of fit into a, a windrow type system. So meaning at harvest time, those beans are going to need to be pulled, put in a windrow, and then typically came back with a dedicated bean harvester for, for combining. You know, the second group we have are indeterminates or upright short vines. Uh, most of our modern varieties, you know, these are our blacks, navies, small reds, uh, most are pintos and some great northerns uh, that can fit into more of a direct harvest system. You know, what we're typically used to seeing in soybean production, you know, have some different modifications there that can help improve that machine's performance um, for dry beans to help limit our mechanical damage and also harvest loss. Uh, but those are our kind of two factors. You know, we need to look and see, you know, what infrastructure we have available to us for equipment, um, what market we're trying to sell into. Uh, maybe we need to, to look into some of our needs and, and think about these things before we decide to, to move into dry bean production. Uh, but that's a, the biggest split I see there is our, our harvest method and what works for our farm and our situation. You know, and to just give kind of a 50,000 foot view of this, you know, we have Phaseolus vulgaris, you know, common bean is our overarching species. Um, that is actually split into dry bean and snap bean. You know, both are considered common bean, just spread for different traits. Um, so snap beans are, you know, your green beans you're used to seeing, you know, same species, just bred for the consumption of that, you know, fresh succulent pod. Um, and then we have dry beans that are bred to have that dry seed combined. And then within dry bean, you see that split into our determinate and our indeterminate growth type. You know, we often refer to those as type one, which would be that determinate plant. Um, and then type two and type three uh, indeterminates, which the type two, you know, we'll often refer to as an upright short vine. Um, and that's what we're used to seeing in our direct harvest systems. You know, and just give you guys kind of a look at what those do look like in the field. You know, we have indeterminate on the left. You know, I believe this is a plot of black beans. Um, and on the right, we have some light red kidney beans. Overall, not a huge difference to them. But when you do actually get down there and look at where that pod height is set, um, you know, those indeterminate plants are typically a little more upright, have those pods a little bit higher off the ground, you know, making them more conducive for a direct harvest system. And once again, you know, that's kind of the main difference there between growth types. You know, indeterminates can be direct harvested. And not to say that you can't still pull and windrow them if you choose to. Um, that is definitely an option. And some growers have found that uh, if we look at mechanical damage, especially in years of low moisture, you know, sometimes we can produce a, a better product through a, a pull and windrow type system, um, given, you know, tougher environmental conditions. Uh, but determinate plants, you know, most, most often we're going to recommend that those are pulled and windrowed. So some other tools that we have for variety selection. Uh, we have a picture here of E3465. Uh, so a little bit of a, a biased uh, standpoint here is I'm the author of this publication in Michigan each year. Um, we think this is a great tool, but we also recommend that you guys look at you know information coming out of your local universities. Um, Ontario runs a great breeding program and uh, variety testing program too, as well as North Dakota and some other regions. So I really recommend that you utilize all of your available resources. You know, you look at these documents and you can really find some great information, you know, on maturity, lodging rates, uh, yield, disease tolerance or resistance, um, and some of those key diseases that we're really looking for, like anthracnose, white mold, you know, and our root rots. 
Um, we hear the term terminology such as product placement um, in the corn and soybean world a lot. And I feel we're a little bit behind in dry beans. You know, we haven't quite got there yet, uh, but I think these multi-locational testing programs, you know, across the state uh, and across North America, you know, are really going to help us move that direction with dry beans and some of the resources that we do have. You know, so uh, an overview of what we did here in Michigan this year. Um, in 2022, we tested 160 separate entries across 12 market classes. Um, we'd say our yields were, were average to slightly above average, uh, which you can see listed here. We have our different counties, Sanilac, Montcalm, Bay, Tuscola, Huron, um, and then our associated yields and pounds per acre for, for an average across the whole trial. Uh, so most of these locations were in the high 20s to low 30s um, and 100 weights per acre. And to give you a reference of where these individual county locations are, you know, we have most of them would be in that, you know, four county area um, in the Thumb and Saginaw Valley where 80 to 90% of the driving production in Michigan takes place each year. Uh, and then we have Montcalm would be our exception, you know, over in the more western half of the state. Um, this is more of a, an irrigated type sand where we do grow a lot of our kidney beans and cranberry beans. Uh, where the majority of everything to the, the east of that Montcalm location is going to be more of a clay loam type soil if we generalize uh, and more blacks, navies, small red type production in a, a direct harvest system where Montcalm is much more common to still be in the pole and windrow system. So we always like to thank our farmer cooperators for these. All these locations are managed on commercial farms within commercial dry bean fields, uh, with the exception of we have Tuscola listed twice here, with the second one being listed as VREC. Uh, and that is here at our research center where uh, my office is currently located. Uh, but all these trials here were planted on the earliest one of May 31st um, and finished up on June 15th. So all within those first two weeks of June, more or less, uh, which would be fairly typical for our, based on historical planning dates. And we'll start to focus just on black beans here in the beginning. Um, and how these trials are structured is the top four locations here, Bay, Huron, Sanilac, and Tuscola, are, are mere replicants of each other. So each black bean variety is tested at each of these farm sites across the state. You know, and if you do Google that, you know, E3465, you know, and you do pull up that publication, we'll just go over briefly, you know, what you'll find and how to interpret it. Uh, so our first column that we have here is entry. Um, so we do test experimentals alongside our commercial varieties. Um, and the easiest way to tell these apart is if you look through that list of entry, you'll see numbers and then you'll see names. If something has a number, you know, it's generally safe to assume that that is a, an experimental line. That's something that's not currently available for purchase. And if something has a name, that's something that has been commercialized and seed may be available. And then we'll look at some of our base agronomics, such as maturity and days after planting, our flowering and days after planting, uh, plant height measured in inches, the top of our canopy, a lodging score that's one to five, with a one being you know, completely upright in the field and a five being you know, completely flat on the ground. So lower numbers are better than higher numbers for lodging. And then white mold infection, that's just calculated on a percent basis. Um, and I always like to compare white mold to our trial average. Um, and typically this is only taken on trials that do have white mold. Uh, so this location, two out of our four locations did have disease present. Um, and we do not spray any fungicides or take any protective measures uh, against white mold as we wanna see those varieties natural, you know, tolerance or avoidance to white mold in the field. Then as we scroll across, we'll see some of our, our individual yield results for those county locations, uh, Bay, Huron, Sanilac, and Tuscola. And the columns I get most excited about are multi-year averages. Uh, so when possible, we take that data and we run that data set you know, over multiple locations over multiple years. Uh, so by the time we get out to a three-year average there, we're looking at you know, a variety that's been tested with four replications at four locations over three years. So it provides us an extremely powerful data set in decision-making uh, when, when looking at variety selection. And we had a couple tools in there. Um, the asterisk system, you'll notice that, that any number like you see here, Nimbus and Bay County yielded 4,071 pounds and that number is followed by two asterisks. Uh, so the easiest way to interpret that is that is our highest numerical yield in that location this year. 
However, any number with one asterisk, such as black bear here at 3814 with one asterisk, that was not statistically different than our highest yielding entry. Uh, so just some tools to, to help easily digest the data. Then we'll dive into black beans a little bit more. Um, so as mentioned, uh, we looked at 33 entries of black beans this year, uh, 10 of which were commercial, so available for purchase generally, and 23 were experimental. I find that quite exciting, especially in black beans, because we feel that we've made the most progress, you know, genetic progress in yield and disease resistance in black beans over, I'd say, the last 10 years. And to still see that we're our trial is two thirds experimental. So, you know, hopefully things that are better than what we're currently growing uh, is really exciting for the future of black beans. Um, average yield was very close to those means I discussed earlier, you know, being in those high 20s to low 30s. Uh, with the exception of Sanilac, you know, the environmental conditions we had in that location this year, the black beans were really well adapted to, you know, and we had a, a trial average there of 37.3 bags to the acre. So we'll look at a quick overview of all 33 there, and then we'll dive in a little deeper into some more uh, variety specific data. Uh, but on the graph that you're looking at here, we have yield on our Y axis in zero to 4,500 pounds to the acre, adjusted 18% moisture. And then we have our each of our individual varieties across the X on the bottom, uh, sorted from you know right to left with our highest yielding entries on the far right. You'll also see a, a kind of lime green line across uh, that represents our trial mean of the whole average. So we really want to focus on you know varieties that are outperforming the mean, uh, and some that that performed exceptionally well this year. That are commercial would be Nimbus, Black Bear, Zenith, and Spectre are some that, that really came into focus and uh, did well in 2022. Uh, when we you know draw that data set out to to three years, so set up the same way, you know yield uh, versus our varieties compared to the mean, uh, Nimbus is one that, that still sits on top for us and has been a top performer for us. Uh, a few other ones that you know weren't mentioned earlier were Adams, which is an MSU black bean, as well as Black Beard, a line out of Provita, a private breeding company. Uh, that, that typically we would expect to perform well uh, based on you know historical data that did not do so well in 2022. Uh, so you know once again looking at more locations and more years, uh, this sorts out our data a little bit cleaner. So then we'll uh, we'll take a look at each of these. So I know some of you guys may not have seen some of these varieties, and maybe some of you have, but this is a good chance to, to see what they look like here in Michigan. Uh, and we'll sort kind of on yield from top to bottom. Uh, and we'll also take a look at canning quality and, and just focus on color for black beans. Uh, so here we have Nimbus. Uh, this All these photos were out of Bay County in 2022 uh, with our average yield rank of 37.3 bags to the acre. And that is a yield that's across four locations in three years uh, with an average maturity just over 100 days at 101, plant height at 19.5 inches, a lodging score that we consider very good at 1.7 out of that 1 to 5 scale, uh, mold infection near average at 61%, uh, and a canning color that's a 2.5. Uh, so canning color is scored on a 1 to 5 as well, with a 1 you know, being considered a light brown color and a 5 being a deep black. Uh, so Nimbus fits right in the middle you know, at that 2.5 uh, compared to the trial average of 3.5. So a little bit on the browner side than black, uh, but right there in the middle of that scale. Then we'll move on to Adams. Uh, for commercial beans, you know, this was our, our number three yield rank, 35.3 uh, hundred weights across those three locations or four locations in three years. Uh, similar maturity, 101 days, a little bit taller on average at 19 inches, uh, lodging score at 2.8 and mold infection at 46%. Uh, we will mention that this year at harvest time, we did have an issue, a quality issue with Adams. Uh, these are seeds directly off the combine um, that did have some, some color issues. You'll see that light purple. Uh, we've seen purples and grays mixed in with the blacks of Adams. Obviously, this is an undesirable trait, and it, it does appear that there's you know instability in the color of Adams. And for that reason, Adams Foundation seed will no longer be supported, unfortunately. So this is not a variety that, that we would expect to be in the marketplace in future years. Um, and it had a canning score of about 2.8. But given that off color at harvest, you know, this is not uh, an economically viable variety headed forward. 
then we'll move on to Spectre. Uh, Spectre has been a, a really stable line for us in Michigan. You know, it's not often at the very top of the yield trial, but it's always really competitive uh, and it handles white mold disease exceptionally well. So it, it's been a, a very solid choice for our growers um, at that number five yield rank. Um, our maturity is a touch longer than some of our other varieties. It's probably the longest maturity black bean that we're growing uh, at 102 days with a 19 inch plant height and a 2.3 lodging score. Uh, but you will notice that mold infection is at 24%. Uh, so that's very low. It handles disease well. You know, when we talk about product placement, you know, you'll start to see some of these things really kind of make themselves evident. You know, if we have fields that we know have issues with white mold disease, you know, Spectre can be a, a great variety, you know, product placement for that specific variety. And we have a canning color of 2.8. Uh, Inspector does struggle a little bit with integrity. Uh, so you'll see more of those broken seeds in Spectre than some of our other uh, varieties that we'll discuss. Then we'll move on to Black Beard. You know, this is our number six yield rank, you know, at 34.4 uh, bags to the acre across those four locations in three years, 101 day maturity. So a little bit shorter than Specter. Uh, you'll notice the plant height is very tall on Black Beard, uh, 22 inches on average uh, with a pretty good lodging score at 2.0. Uh, Black Beard is one that uh, in times of excess moisture, we get a little too much growth to Black Beard. We can have a lodging issue with it. Um, and it is relatively susceptible to white mold. You know, you can actually see here in the photo the, the white stems that are in the center of uh, black beard, which is indicative of white mold infection. You know, severity was not high, but incidence was uh, that, you know, correlated to that 67% infection. Um, but where black beard really does shine through is in our canning quality. So you'll see we have a 4.5 canning color average on that. And you can see how much more of a deep black color you get after processing from black beard. And that deep black is really what's desirable more times than not versus the lighter brown. And then, you know, more of a standard for us, this is an MSU variety of Zenith, uh, still performs very well. You know, it seems to, to actually done better in probably the past two field seasons than it had the two prior to that. Uh, we're back up to about a 34 bag average on Zenith, uh, 100 day variety, you know, shorter plant height, 17 inches, very good lodging score at 1.0 uh, and mold infection that's also very low at 25%. Um, and you can see from the photo, the, the excellent canning quality that we do get out of Zenith. Uh, so I know there's been some seed availability issues with Zenith in the past couple of years, uh, but if we can get our hands on seed, you know, Zenith is definitely a very uh, viable uh, variety choice for us, particularly if we're interested in the canning market. So we'll shift gears a little bit now, and we kind of tailored this more to uh, your guys' region. So we talked about blacks, and now we'll talk about kidney beans a little bit too. Uh, so we'll look at two sites here. You know, our top one listed is SVREC. That's here in the, the Thumb and Saginaw Valley region, which is not irrigated. The bottom one there listed Montcalm um, location at Raider Farms. That is an irrigated location that's more on a, uh, a sandy loam type soil. Uh, we're here at SVREC, we're a heavy clay loam. So we'll start with light red kidney beans. Uh, this is a trial that had 15 entries, uh, a little more evenly split between our commercial and experimentals, uh, with six being commercial and nine being experimental. Um, and then you can really see the difference that, that irrigation does make in our average yields this year. You know, Montcalm or light red kidney beans average, you know, over 34 bags to the acre, uh, where in Tuscola here without irrigation, you know, we're 17.6. You know, and we do keep the data separate uh, for irrigated versus non-irrigated. Um, a lot of times we'll see some trends that, that are interesting, you know, in both production systems, and, and we kind of lose those if we try to uh, merge those trials together. Uh, so we keep them separate by that factor. So once again, we're sorted uh, by yield here, top to bottom, instead of left to right, uh, with our variety names. Uh, you see the top of this graph is pretty heavy on experimentals. Uh, running down our, our Y and then across the bottom on our X, you know, we have a uh, yield in pounds per acre, you know, compared to that mean line. So you'll see there is exciting, uh, hopefully an exciting future in light red kidney beans. Uh, one I will note here, P076D1, uh, that is actually a soldier bean that we did test uh, in our light red kidney bean trial, since we did not have any other soldier beans to test it with, um, it landed in that trial. And obviously we see some excellent yield out of that. So hopefully that's uh, an exciting news uh, for soldier beans. Then we'll come down to some of our more standards, uh, California Early, uh, Ronnie's Red, Red Dawn, Clouseau, Big Red and Pink Panther, you know, as we start to drop below the mean line. 
you know, and if we expand that data set out, you know, build a few more years into that, you know, we see a very similar trend. Uh, if we just discussed yields, you know, Big Red and California Early um, have been two that are kind of on the top of our market. Uh, Cal Early has been the standard here in Michigan light red kidney bean production for a long time. Uh, but we also have seen uh, an increase in Pink Panther acres over the past few years um, due to some disease issues that, that we'll discuss here in a minute. And then Ronnie's red would be at our bottom. You know, you will notice that if you look at the non-irrigated uh, or dry land type conditions, uh, Ronnie's red is one that that really does not respond super well to irrigation uh, and typically does better in those more arid conditions. Uh, so when we work with growers that are growing some non-irrigated light red kidney beans, Ronnie's red can be a, a good fit for those acres. So to give you guys an idea what these looked like this year, uh, we had a, a very lush trial this year, lots of growth, uh, good soil fertility, um, and good irrigation. Uh, so you'll see that come through in the plant structure here and the, the percent white mold infection that was achieved. Uh, and we'll start with big red. You know, we're averaging at 34.8 bags to the acre, you know, across the past three years. Uh, that typical shorter maturity that we'll see in a light red kidney bean at 91 days, 18-inch uh, plant height, uh, lodging score at 2.8, um, an 88% mold infection uh, compared to that average of 66%. But it is important to remember that is in complete absence of fungicide um, and absence of cultivation in this particular trial, which can typically help a little bit. And then our canning scores, you know, these were scored for integrity. Uh, this is uh, scoring at a 2.0 compared to a 2.2 average. Um, and once again, that's on a one to five with a five being, you know, excellent integrity and a one being very poor. Hey, Scott. Yes. Um, someone had asked um, how you note maturity um, at physiological maturity or 90% dry down. Yes. So we note that at physiological maturity and days after planting. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so then we'll move on to, to kale early. Um, if you would have asked three years ago what percent uh, of Michigan light red kidney beans are kale early, it probably would have been 90 plus percent. Uh, we have had uh, issues pop up with halo blight the past couple of years. Um, so this is a, a bacterial disease that's typically mitigated by the use of, of disease-free seed. Um, which is a, a standard for us in Michigan, uh, just due to our humidity issues. Um, we're still sourcing disease-free seed, uh, but we still have uh, halo blight, you know, coming into our environments and infecting kale early, uh, which is a very sensitive variety to these bacterial issues. Um, so this is an issue that has raised the past two to three years in a row um, that has moved some of our production out of California early to some varieties that are a little less sensitive uh, just to help mitigate that risk that we do have. Uh, but California early has that short maturity at 87 days um, and also an excellent package quality, has really good color. And that's really what we've liked about Cal early as we can struggle a little bit with our environmental conditions to, to keep that really you know pinkish, uh, light red kidney color that you want and not have it turn that, that darker brown that sometimes we can get. And canning score is not excellent here at a 1.6, uh, but really we're after that, that package quality out of Cal Early. And then Red Dawn, a little bit of a newer variety for us, uh, our yield average at 33.9 bags to the acre, uh, very similar Cal Early type maturity, so you're excited about that when you're looking for a potential replacement, uh, 14 inch plant height. 77% um, white mold infection, and, and right on the average at 2.2 with that canning quality. And then Pink Panther, we'd say this is, is probably replaced uh, a good majority of our California early uh, acres in the past couple of years. It appears to be quite a bit less sensitive to halo blight uh, and still maintains a, a decent package quality. Um, that Rolling yield average is at 33.7 bags to the acre. Uh, definitely more of a full season variety at 98 days uh, and definitely taller, you know, at a 20 inch plant height. So definitely quite different than uh, California early, uh, but has fit that niche well for our Michigan growers. Uh, mold infection rate, you know, 63%. So just below average and a canning score of 1.6. So then we'll touch briefly on dark red kidney beans as well. A little bit bigger trial for us actually than our light red kidneys, uh, even though we don't have many acres of dark red kidneys left here. Uh, but we looked at 18 entries, uh, seven which being commercial and 11 being experimental. Um, and once again, Montcalm, you know, vastly outperforming our Tuscola location at, you know, a 31 bag average versus 18.4. 
you know, sorted top to bottom uh, for both our irrigated and non-irrigated yields uh, for just 2022. Uh, once again, you know, a few experimentals right at the top, which is exciting news about the future of dark red kidney beans. Uh, but also we see some more standards and some new varieties that mix in there too. You know, both Epic and Dynasty are some newer varieties in dark red kidneys that we've been excited about. Uh, but then also you see some some older standards like Red Hawk um, and Mockcom that are still performing above, if not very close to the mean. And then if we look at our bigger data set, you know, across those three years, you know, we have Dynasty that's on top. Um, and Dynasty has been a dark red kidney bean that, that has shown excellent performance in both irrigated and non-irrigated situations um, and, and will be exciting to watch in the future for Dynasty. But we also have Red Hawk that is still, you know, meeting or just barely coming above the mean there uh, for dark red kidney beans. So to give you guys a quick look at these, you know, have Dynasty at that number one yield rank at 34.8 bags, you know, and that is a, an irrigated average there uh, with 100 day maturity. So we're going to definitely talk about full season beans and dark reds for the most part uh, with a 22 inch plant height, uh, lodging score at 2.8 uh, and mold infection at 75% compared to that 73% average and a canning score of 2.4. So performing a little bit better in our dark red canning uh, rather than our light red kidney beans. Then we'll look at Epic, you know, that number uh, number five yield rank, but number two uh, commercial variety. Uh, so this is a 32.2 uh, hundred weight per acre average at 104 days. So definitely longer maturities. Uh, plant height at 20 inches, lodging score at 2.8 uh, and canning score at 2.4 compared to a three average. Then we have Red Hawk. Uh, so this is a uh, more standard for us in Michigan. Uh, full season, once again, you know, 101 day maturity with an average yield of 31.5 hundred weights. Uh, plant height at 22 inches, lodging score at 2.3, mold infection at 65% and a uh, canning score near the average there at 2.9. Do you guys have any questions on varieties before we kind of switch gears and, and move into uh, more agronomic conversations? There seems to be a lot of, um, a few questions. Let's see, Ran uh, Rodney Graham was asking about Red Hawk, which I believe you just answered. He wanted to know, is uh, Red Hawk still a player? Yes, I would say so. Um, it's definitely a, an older variety, but uh, yeah, we can look at it right there. You know, we're still averaging, you know, 31 and a half bags, um, plus Red Hawk does have anthracnose resistance too. So that's uh, an exciting trait, and especially if we're talking organic production, you know, where we don't have options of fungicides. Um, Red Hawk is very much still a player there. It may have a little bit of a, a yield uh, handicap compared to, to maybe Dynasty or some of these newer ones we've seen, uh, but there's some differences in uh, seed shape and size too. So it's important to know what your market is looking for. All right, and Rodney is a organic grower in New York, so that makes sense. Um, there's also a question around how growing degree days are calculated for dry beans. Oh, no, maybe we can answer that one quick. Yeah, from my standpoint, typically we don't use growing degree days for for a lot. Um, we do report them in our trial averages uh, with your base of 50, uh, but most of our evaluations are done in just uh, actual days after planting. Okay, and there is a question about um, University of California's Jacobs cattle. And I don't know if you know about that. I know Kristen was the one, yeah. Yeah, we have not particularly tested that. If Kristen uh, cares to, to chime in or add anything, she's more than welcome here. Yeah, it just asked if it was commercially available. Yeah, the, um, yeah, speaking to the question about uh, what is the difference, um, we've seen it yields better and it has um, BCMV resistance um, as well. Commercially available wise, uh, it's sort of still getting rolled out. So um, we might have to get back to you on that. We, we have been able to source kind of in small amounts, but that might be something we follow up on because we know there's a lot of interest in those Davis releases. All right. Okay. We'll let you Excellent. keep going. 
<laughs> Thank you. So uh, yeah, it was a good chance to uh, catch a drink of coffee here and uh, catch your breath. So now we'll shift gears and uh, move into more of our the agronomic side of things. You know, we'll start with rotations, you know, tillage, you know, and timing of some of these programs. Uh, so once again, the majority of the dry beans here in Michigan are in you know conventional agriculture, which for us in this region involves sugar beets. Um, so typically our recommendation is a, a three to four year rotation, you know, is really best for disease management. Um, and a lot of times, you know, this is a, a screenshot we have here of our actual part of our research farm that's in a Circospora rotation for sugar beets. Uh, but this is, would be a very common, you know, corn, wheat, sugar beet, and dry bean type four year rotation for us. You know, another one uh, without sugar beets, you know, looks more like corn, dry beans, and wheat. You know, you have synergies there between you know, dry beans and winter wheat cropping. Um, you also have some good opportunities for cover cropping too, you know, after corn ahead of dry beans. Um, I should have added, you know, after wheat as well, you know, provides us a great window ahead of corn. Uh, so really we recommend a, a three to four year type rotation, you know, specifically for if we're focused on our, our dry bean production and productivity. You know, most dry beans here are planted into conventional tillage. Um, and then there's multiple reasons why that has kind of stayed the the standard of our production. Uh, one is that PPI herbicides are, are really a foundation of our weed control programs um, in our conventionally produced dry beans. Um, but you know, I will note that that crop residue is really our friend. You know, when it comes to stand establishment, especially when we see inclement weather. You know, we've seen this last year that we had a very warm and dry spring. You know, which is good. We got soil temps up. You know, but we also had, you know, the second week of June, 80 mile an hour winds that came through the state. Um, well, on conventionally tilled soils that were tilled the first week of June and you bring in 80 mile an hour winds, you know, two to three weeks later, we see a lot of soil movement and we have dry beans that are one to two inches tall. Um, crop residue can be our friend to help keep soil put, you know, protect that soil um, and really works out in our favor if we can, you know, keep that tillage um, keep our residue management up. You know, also soil temps, you know, I, I try to caution our growers from getting excited, you know, about getting the dry bean planter out until we have crossed the soil temp of 65 degrees, you know, and we see a, a trend for that to continue to rise. You know, we don't want to plant, you know, at soil, soil temps of 65 degrees, you know, if we're going to have a week of cold weather, um, that's generally not conducive for, for staying establishment of dry beans. You know, in North Dakota, had done some of this work, and and I always like to share this because because every year that we get a, a warm start to the spring, like maybe we'll have this year, who knows? You know, it's been a pretty mild winter. You know, there's a question. You know, is there an advantage to early planting of dry beans? Um, and, you know, guys here are particularly are focused on their winter wheat crop that's coming after. So you know, if you get your dry beans planted early, theoretically you should harvest early, and theoretically you should plant your wheat early, which we know is conducive for winter wheat. Um, but uh, our friends out at NDSU, you know, over a three to five year range, you know, looked at some different trials related to planting dates, you know, and their planting period, I would say, is a little bit earlier than ours on average, just due to the risk of frost in the fall uh, that uh, knock on wood, we don't quite have as high of a risk of. You know, they looked at time frames of, you know, May 13th to the 23rd, you know, May 27th to June 5th, and then June 12th to June 18th, you know, and they found that they were able to, you know, establish, you know, adequate stands at any of those dates, you know, seed yield ended up non-significant, but you can see a, a numerical trend towards the later dates. Uh, but really what I like to focus on is the, the stages of plant development, you know, planting to emergence is a, a huge factor in my opinion. The the lower that number can be, the better off we are for our dry bean crop. You know, and you can see that uh, you know, our emergence physiological maturity, you know, stayed pretty similar in the 80 to 83 days. But what really moved was that planting to emergence date. You know, that at your early planting, it took 15 days between when they planted those dry beans and they emerged. You know, middle date you're at 10 and their later date they're at eight. You know, so really our, our best uh, best way to manage risk that we managed mentioned in the beginning is to get those dry beans out of the ground as soon as we can. Uh, you know, we're in excellent shape when we plant dry beans and they're up in four or five days. You know, that's really an ideal situation. And when we're not waiting to see our dry beans for almost two weeks, you know, that's not an excellent way to start our season. So in my opinion, there, there typically is not an advantage to early planting of dry beans. 
you know, so the next question comes up is depth. <laughs> and I have always answered this with to moisture, you know, which can be a, a kind of complicated topic, you know, and usually leads to a lengthy phone conversation when we're talking with growers. Uh, but really that key is to get into consistent moisture. You know, we want all our dry beans to come up at once. You know, I'd say an inch and a half is ideal, you know, on planting depth, uh, but we can go as deep as three um, if we watch the weather after planting. Um, and I would not recommend deeper than three inches, but we need to make sure we get those dry beans into consistent moisture so we can have them germinate and emerge in a uniform manner. In the spring, I would say dry conditions are generally better than wet. Uh, we've had, you know, two springs here the past two years that have been, I would say, warmer and drier than normal, uh, which can cause issues like we have our second picture here where it looks like we had some skips in the planter. Well, actually there's beans there. They just didn't quite make it into moisture. So those beans will sit there and not germinate until we got a rainfall and then they're gonna come up, which the trends we've had the past couple of years, you know, that can be two, three, four weeks before we got a rainfall that actually got those beans to emerge, uh, which then cause unevenness in our stand, unevenness in maturity, you know, and unevenness in, in crop progress when we're looking towards harvest, which can have really negative implications on both yield and quality. So there has been a lot of questions of how do we manage moisture in the spring, you know, looking at conventional tillage programs, you know, not overworking our soils, you know, not leaving an excessive amount of time between when that, you know, soil finisher came across the field and when the planter comes uh, to making sure we're really thinking about our operations a little bit more uh, so we can manage moisture more efficiently. You know, and when we are thinking about planting, we really need to consider upcoming weather patterns. You know, like we said, we can plant dry beans at three inches in dry conditions. But if 72 hours later, we receive a thunderstorm that drops an inch to an inch and a half of rain on us, we can be in trouble. Uh, because when that sun comes back out and we get soil crusting as the top layer dries back out, dry beans are not the most exceptional, you know, pushers, you know, to push through that soil crusting. Uh, and it can really cause issues there. And a lot of times we'll end up in a replant type situation. Um, so we often say, if you, if you want to plant twice, you got to start early. <laughs> but if you only want to plant once, you know, really wait for that ideal conditions, you know, consider that upcoming weather pattern. And the last note we will have too is to watch soil movement during rolling. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about rolling, but when things get really dry, you know, especially on lighter soils, uh, at rolling after planting, we have seen some soil movement that can end up burying dry beans a little bit deeper than we thought we had them planted, you know, by the time that roller heads across the field. So, you know, we talked about when we're going to plant, you know, how we're going to plant. Now let's talk about, you know, what population we're going to plant. You know, I'd say this is highly debated and highly researched. You know, the, the phone call that typically drags on a little bit longer than how deep do I plant my dry beans is, you know, how many seeds per acre do I plant them? Because there's a lot of factors that do go into it and a lot of things to think about. Uh, we've done research here over three growing seasons in the recent memory. Um, and, and many more years before that, uh, but so of our collaborators in North Dakota and some other regions uh, that we kind of came up with this 100 to 130,000 seeds per acre, you know, and what I'm going to refer to as narrow rows, which would be the majority of our production here is in 20 to 22 inch rows. You know, some kind of quick math that you can use to adapt that to, to wide rows, which I consider 30 inch rows, is you can probably pull that recommendation down about 10%. Um, and also that 100 to 130,000 recommendation, you know, is really looking at our indeterminate beans. So blacks, navies, small reds, great northerns and pinos. Uh, if we're talking about kidney beans, we can probably pull that down about another 10%. So meaning if you're planting a dark red kidney bean in 30 inch rows, we can come down, you know, 20% off of that 100 to 130,000 seeds per acre, you know, assuming standard germination rates, you know, greater than 90%. You know, and to come up with that, you know, we had 10 locations over three years. The most rigorous that I'll share with you guys today was conducted here at the research farm in 2021. Um, in this trial, we looked at populations as low as 50,000 and as high as 150,000 in 20 inch rows for Zenith black beans. So it's a little bit of a, a busy graph that we'll unpack here. Once again, you have yield per acre on your left axis and you have planting populations across the bottom. You know, and you can see those come from 50 on the far left all the way over to 150,000 on the far right. And then yield is in pounds per acre, you know, represented by these red bars. And you'll see kind of exactly what we expect. You know, yield 
trends up with planting population till we kind of reach that 100 to 130,000 range. And you'll see it does start to tail off a little bit as you get to those really high populations. You know, the other interesting thing to, that you could factor in here would be return on investment for seed, uh, which that's not uh, considered in this uh, general table here. So that's how this is a good uh, representation of why we use that 100 to 130,000 recommendation for planting populations. The other interesting thing that you will see um, is this uh, blue bar that runs across, which is our actual plants per acre at harvest time. You know, and this is represented on our second uh, axis here in zero to 80,000 plants per acre. You know, as you look at that, there's some interesting takeaways here. You know, at our 50,000 plants per acre seeding rate, you know, we harvested about 40,000 plants, you know, about what you would expect. You know, but as we trend up, you know, you start to see that proportion get smaller and smaller to where we plant 150,000 seeds per acre and we're only harvesting about 75,000 plants per acre. You know, so we're less than 50% of our seed planted here actually results in a plant that we're going to harvest. Um, so that's an interesting trend, um, you know, as we look at that uh, inner plant competition, uh, which these were planted with just, uh, you know, what I would say is a conventional vacuum planter. Um, you know, we weren't uh, decked out with precision planting, you know, et cetera. And, and maybe that is something that could help improve that in the future. Uh, but assuming, you know, standard planting equipment, uh, this is a, a unique finding that we did have. You know, just to kind of summarize, you know, most often emerged populations of 70,000 plants per acre. Um, so once again, not talking planted seeds, but actual 70,000 plants per acre supported average yields uh, in 20 to 22 inch rows, which we're going to call average yields, you know, here for us would be less than 35 bags to the acre. There were some times where we documented higher plant populations greater than 70,000 emerged plants per acre can support above average yields. So we're talking 35 bags or greater per acre, given the right conditions. So that's where we really kind of landed on that, you know, 100 to 130,000, you know, seeds per acre at planting with a goal of achieving that 70,000 plants per acre. Uh, but the tough part is, you know, only you, the grower, can really decide what seeding rate is needed to produce that, that you know, that early season stand of that adequate density of 70,000 plants. You know, we have to consider percent germination, you know, soil crusting, weather patterns, you know, all these things that go into it. And, you know, at the same time working on this, you know, North Dakota also was looking at it from a little bit of a different angle, um, you know, and what they had found, you know, was more focused on disease findings. Um, so they had found that dry beans, you know, had a yield advantage in narrow rows. So 20 to 22 inch rows had a slight yield advantage compared to 30 inch rows in years of white mold, low white mold pressure or under increased management. So essentially what they found is when disease became a factor, you know, we lost that advantage that we did have to narrow rows um, due to increased disease incidence and severity that we can have in narrower rows. So that was quite an interesting finding. Um, and they also found that with increased planting populations, you know, can once again, that yield advantage can be erased, you know, with disease pressure. So a little bit of a caveat that comes in there, if we start to think about pushing planting populations above 70,000 plants per acre, or revisiting our role with conversation. So now we've moved on after planting um, and now we'll move on to field rolling. Um, so field rolling is something that really made direct harvest an economically possible uh, venture here in the state of Michigan. Uh, nearly all direct harvested dry beans in Michigan that are conventional um, weed control methods are rolled. You know, and basically this is the, the big rollers that are very, now very common in soybean production as well, you know, pushes down, you know, those ridges from planting, stones, dirt clods um, to really create a, a nice flat surface uh, for that cutter bar to run very close to the soil, you know, but not in the soil and, and have our harvest loss as low as possible. You know, and with this rolling, you were seeing no more in-season cultivation, um, because if we roll that soil, then come back through with a cultivator and hill things back up, you know, we've kind of negated the benefit that we had with the roller. 
Um, many guys will look at you know different timings for that rolling application. Some guys will roll at more of a pre-plant date, which you can see just a, a quick screenshot of a trial we did here, oh, 10 years ago um, at the research farm, where we looked at different timings you know, compared to an untreated. And uh, numerically, there was a trend for letting that soil dry out a little bit um, and rolling a few days after planting, but prior to emergence. Uh, but there are options in there that, that allow us to have a little bit of flexibility of when that soil is rolled. Now, beans that are you know more pulled and windrowed, you know we're we're not rolling. Uh, we're actually coming through with you know cultivation passes to to really put a ridge on those beans to to help that puller come through and actually pull those bean ruts out when it comes to harvest time. Uh, so once again, you know that's going to take place you know closer to our herbicide application timings um, and can even trail later into the growing season depending on our our weed pressure. Um, and those ridges are, are really conducive for helping that you know rod or knife uh, get through the soil and pull those beans out. So then we'll move on to uh, fertility and nutrient management, uh, which I would say for dry beans is actually quite easy. You know, it really comes down to, to having a soil test, knowing your critical levels and following them. You know, here are recommendations out of our MSU publication. Uh, I'm sure you guys have your own local recommendation as well. Uh, and just make sure that we're sticking to those. Um, and if we are above critical levels, you know, dry beans are excellent scavengers. You know, so in times of high input prices like we are at right now, don't be afraid to draw from the bank. You know, especially if we're talking about P and K. You know, dry beans, you know, typically we will not see a yield penalty. You know, especially if we're at or above those those critical levels uh, from not, you know, having any P and K, you know, directly applied to that crop. You know, nitrogen, our standard recommendation has been 40 to 60 pounds per acre total, you know, per growing season. Uh, so we need to make sure that we include all our credits, you know, whether that's manure, you know, cover crops, etc. Because if we push nitrogen too hard on dry beans, we can have multiple negative effects. You know, first, environmental, obviously, we don't want to use more nitrogen than needed. You know, second being we can extend dry bean maturity out longer than we want and not see a yield benefit from that. And three, given the right conditions, we can create larger problems with white mold disease in our dry bean crops. Um, we can also see lodging issues at times if we get those beans to kind of outgrow their structure, structure and get too tall. One other thing that we have trended towards uh, here in Michigan with some of our pHs on our soils, uh, we have seen benefits to banded application of zinc and manganese uh, when used early um, in the season. So then, uh, you know, once again, we ran many trials, especially focusing on nitrogen rates, uh, but this is one example of a strip trial we have that, that kind of helps validate uh, why we're using that 40 to 60 pound recommendation. Uh, if you see yield in pounds per acre on our first axis, we have nitrogen rates across the bottom from 0, 25, 50, 75, all the way up to 100. Uh, you can see that 50 is really kind of our peak here in the middle. Um, this follows a, a typical bimodal type curve. So meaning there's typically two peaks in nitrogen response. You know, so you trend up from zero, you peak at 50, you know, you dip back down a little bit and then you'll find a second curve as you get really high in those nitrogen rates. Uh, but if we throw some pricing in there, you know, and actually look at net income per acre, you know, simply, you know, looking at $45 beans, which I'm not sure we have right now in black beans, minus just our fertilizer cost. So just a, a really oversimplified manner of looking at that. You know, we see that uh, our 40 to 60 pound recommendation really makes sense, you know, across standard nitrogen pricing. Um, and even when we get into to times like now where, you know, urea might be 700 to $1,000 a ton, you know, we're not losing money, uh, but it is something that still is a, a valid recommendation. All right, so now we'll shift into weed control a little bit. Looks like I got about 20 minutes left here. Um, so are there any questions we want to, to head off before we move into weed control? Some, um, there was a question about seeding rates. Do you recommend higher seeding rates to organic growers? So, yep, that is a great question. Um, and the answer can be yes, you know, especially if we're thinking that we may lose some stand, whether that's from disease, um, early season root rots, um, we might want to push our um, 
seeding rate up a little bit as we don't have some seed treatments uh, or those you know, early season insecticides uh, to help uh, control some things like wireworm or seed corn maggots. Um, and also if we think we may lose some in those early stages of cultivation, um, we could push it up a little bit on those seeding rates. And, and we generally don't see a real yield penalty from pushing those seeding rates. It's more uh, of your input cost of you know, units per seed per acre. Thank you. Um, there was a question about root rot and best practices, but if you are going to talk about that shortly, we can hold off on that. Yeah, I didn't have too much included on root rot. Um, we've screened a lot of varieties for resistance or tolerance to root rots, and I would say that's still a, a work in progress. We know we have some breeding lines that are much more tolerant than others. Um, in commercial varieties, it's difficult to say that, that we have you know one variety that really outperforms the others within a market class. Um, our best practices, I would say, are probably that three to four year rotation that we recommended, you know, making sure that we have that rotation, we have that diversity in the rotation um, and help, you know, eliminating, you know, compaction, as we know, those are directly rank, linked with root rots, as well as improving our drainage. Okay, thank you. I, I think that's all the questions for now, um, but uh, I'll keep. Okay, excellent. With that, we'll keep on moving then. Uh, so here we'll focus a little bit on uh, what we call our PRAB survey. Uh, so that is our production research advisory board here in the state of Michigan. Uh, that is a subsidiary of our Michigan Bean Commission, our, our grower checkoff organization. Um, so we run the survey each year, you know, asking growers a series of questions about their production practices. You know, and these slides uh, are from Dr. Christy Sprigg as we work together closely on these. Um, and we ask growers, you know, what weeds are most likely to escape control and dry bean? Um, and our, our common answers are, you know, our common weeds, lambs quarters, pig weeds, ragweed. Uh, we have seen an increase in horseweed um, as well as Eastern Black Nightshade the few years. And then we will sort this out for conventional versus organic growers. And organic growers, we definitely see a trend towards the grasses being more of a problem uh, than we see with our conventional growers. So we'll kind of share just some key foundation here. Um, and our soil applied herbicides are really our you know, important foundation for effective weed control you know, when we're talking about conventional weed control, which we'll share some things about organic you know, once we wrap up the conventional portion here. But our soil applieds are you know, really important as that foundation, you know, especially when we're talking about those hard control herbicide resistant weeds. And it really reduces the number of weeds that are present when we do make that post application. So it helps us take some of the pressure off of just that post application uh, by using that, that soil applied uh, initial PPI or pre application. And PPIs are generally our recommendation if possible. We know that there are some challenges with that, you know, when it comes to, to labor, logistics, equipment, uh, but PPIs can really help limit the effects that dry weather have on those applications. Because we've all seen when we put that pre-application down, we don't get any rainfall, you know, we don't, we aren't able to get that pre-activated um, and we don't see the benefit that we could have seen out of that, where that PPI can really help us mitigate some of those challenges. So if we look at what our growers are using, you know, for either PPI or pre herbicides used in the state of Michigan, you know, our most popular would be group 15s, dual and outlook. Uh, but we also have quite a few of group three use, which is, you know, most of the time PPI only here with Prowl, Treflin and Sonalan. Uh, but we also do see some Eptam. Um, and then, you know, we have relatively low use of Pursuit. Um, I would say for us, that's most likely well, we do know that the issue is crop rotation. Uh, so I believe it's something like a five year uh, crop rotation restriction um, from the use of pursuit to sugar beets. Uh, so for you know most of our dry bean region, we overlap with sugar beet production. So there's not a lot of pursuit used in Michigan where some other regions is much more common. And I would also mention a lot of these, you know, we'll see different tank mixes used in a PPI application like dual mixed with Prowl um, or Outlook, et cetera. And then we do have that other column that you know, we always kind of question what that other is, and we're assuming that's probably reflex in this situation. Um, a clarifying question, the response rating, is that crop response or weed control? So this was the, that's a great question. This was the number of growers that we surveyed um, and the percent of those growers that responded of using those products. So just to give you an idea of what our growers here are using. Thank you. 
And yep, on along the lines of uh, crop response, you know, once again, that PPI can help minimize dry bean injury as well. You know, it's helped mitigate that effect of dry weather. So when we look at some of these hard to control weeds that we mentioned, you know, our common lambs quarter, ragweed, pigweed, horseweed, eastern black nightshade, I'm um, in our grasses, you know, we can look at some of these products and see what is excellent, what is good, what is fair. You know, when we talk about, uh, you know, our most difficult here for us, lambs quarter, you know, we're really looking at, you know, our prowls, our sandalines, our trefflin, um, and eptam. Uh, common ragweed, you know, pursuit, which we're not using a lot of, you know, reflex and maybe eptam. Where this gets a little more complicated when we look across, um, you know, what's good, you know, excellent, what options we have is when we throw in our different resistances that are very common here in Michigan. Uh, group two or ALS resistance, you know, we're assuming that 99.9% .9 of our common ragweed population, you know, now has group two resistance. So if we throw that in and then we look at what options we have, you know, it's really a, a pretty thin deck of cards that we're playing with for our pre and PPI options and dry beans. You know, to bring that even, you know, a little bit further, if we bring in group 14 resistance, which has been documented here as well, you know, it makes that deck a little bit smaller. Uh, so it really kind of brings us full circle to, to thinking about IPM, you know, management, you know, how can we take the pressure off of these products that we do have, you know, as we have a, a relatively limited, you know, number of products. You know, and we have recommended saving reflex for our post applications um, because first off, that's really where we kind of need it. You know, we're even thinner on options for post applications to control these weeds given our resistance. Um, and we're only limited to one pint every other year. Um, so given those two factors, we, we have really recommended saving our reflex for post. You know, and given that thin deck that we just discussed, you know, post herbicides are going to be needed for effective weed control if we're not looking at cultivation, you know, for those direct harvest type conventional systems. You know, and once again, once we survey growers and ask, you know, what products are they using and look at the percent of response from those growers, you know, who say what they're using, um, it's a, a pretty small list. You know, we, we have our most popular of Bassigran and Raptor, uh, which then is followed by Varisto. Um, so if you're familiar with those products, Varisto is actually just a premix of Raptor and Bassigran, um, as Raptor has to be tank mixed with Bassigran um, as it acts as a safener. You know, our other very popular product would be Reflex, you know, that we recommended saving for post and a little bit of permit um, and then some group ones, you know, so our grass herbicides, you know, as a sure to select, etc. You know, and then unfortunately we do run into that same issue. If we start throwing re weed resistance in there, you know, if we throw in group two resistance, you know, our Raptor is not going to work. That Raptor component in our Varisto is not going to work. Permit's not going to be an option for us. And then if we throw in group 14 resistance again, you know, that kind of takes out our reflex. Um, so it's something we really need to be cautious of, you know, and how we're using these tools, you know, and you might look at Bassergran or group six and say, well, that's good news. We don't have resistance there. You know, those of us that, that are familiar with Bassergran, we know that weeds need to be very small for Bassergran to be an effective tool, you know, against either our lambs quarter or our common ragweed. And then once again, when we talk about things like pursuits, you know, keep in mind that we do have those 18 month or greater rotation restrictions on some of these. So always, you know, consult your, your local references uh, for, for those crop rotation restrictions. So now let's talk about what does the organic version of this look like? You know, and I would say, you know, similar to conventional, every operation is a little bit different, you know, but based on our grower surveys, we can kind of, you know, summarize, you know, some of the things our growers are doing. Um, and similar to conventional, once again, the biggest thing is to start clean. Um, a lot of our organic dry beans, you know, maybe are planted a little bit on the later side than conventional uh, because we're letting those weeds continue to flush, you know, and taking them out with clean tillage passes prior to the actual seeding of the dry bean crop. You want to make sure that we can get as much of that seasonal weed flush out of that system as possible ahead of planting. You know, then we go through our standard planting times. Um, and prior to emergence, some growers are going through with rotary hose to try to, to kind of nip that up again. You know, if there's any small weeds that are emerging, you know, keep those, you know, as small as possible and remove them from the system. Then generally we're going to plan on two to three row crop cultivation passes, you know, depending on what that, uh, that weed pressure looks like in that given year, that given field, given soil type, et cetera. 
you know, and there's virtually no way around it. Typically, we're still not perfect, you know, after those row crop, you know, cultivations. Um, then we're looking at some different tools. Uh, we've seen a lot of these, you know, electrics, I'll call them zappers. You know, you see in the top picture that can help, you know, actually kill those weeds that stick up above the canopy. You know, that's often in used in a, a combination with hand weeding, you know, that's then done, you know, below the canopy to help control those, those weed species. Um, I know a lot of our growers will have kind of more of a, a targeted list, you know, when we do send hand, hand labor into the fields, you know, you'll go through with the zapper, you know, either before or after and say, hey, we can control anything and above the canopy with this, you know, but when we get into species like nightshade uh, or maybe field bindweed, you know, that can be a problem below the canopy. Those are what we really need that assistance of hand weeding for. You know, and we can say, you know, this is really time consuming and expensive, but, you know, weeds are not resistant to steel or electricity. Uh, so that is the one uh, advantage we do have in these systems. And I do throw the caveat as yet in there yet, because weeds will never fail to uh, continue to, to evolve and survive. But hopefully we still have some time before we need to deal with that. So in the interest of time, we'll kind of, you know, buzz through some of these fungicide questions quite briefly. Um, but it always comes up the question of why are we spraying in dry beans? You know, and it's really important to think about our disease triangle. You know, when we do make those uh, determinations, uh, we need to think about our environment. We need to think about what pathogens we do have present. Um, and we're primarily talking about foliar disease management here. Uh, we did mention the, the root diseases and some of those other things that are, are primarily addressed through either genetics, which is a, a limited pool that we have currently, uh, or our rotation, you know, our basic soil health uh, principles. And then in the disease triangle, it's if we're talking about dry beans, typically we have that host there, you know, if we're talking about these, you know, our kind of main targets. And when we talk about, you know, foliar disease, um, for us, you know, more often than not, there's kind of three things. We have white mold, you know, sclerotinia, anthracnose, um, and then a kind of onslaught of different bacterial diseases, you know, we'll often just kind of lump into the, the column of bacterial. Um, and now we'll go through each of these and, and actually talk about some different management strategies that we can take to these in both conventional and organic systems. Um, and I do throw the caveat up there of we'll hear the, the topic of plant health a lot. Um, and I'm not going to say that that's not uh, a possibility in dry beans, but I think a lot of the documentation that, that we do have in trials and research um, that you know may say, well, this is a plant health response to fungicides. A lot of times what we're seeing is actually low level suppression. Um, so we can have white mold in fields that you know may come in at you know, 10, 15, 20% infection. Um, and if you were to drive by that field, if you were to combine that field, you may say that there's not white mold disease out there, but when we actually get down and look at that symptomology, you know, we do still see a low level of percent infection just with low severity. So when those applications are made, you know, I, we can see some of that yield benefit from those applications. So we'll kind of start with our first disease here of that we got uh, white mold, you know, in our kind of approach to management. Um, and we'll kind of keep, you know, four bullet points for each of these disease topics, um, and then kind of my opinion of what our impact is. Uh, so when we talk about white mold, you know, one topic that comes up is rotation. You know, can my cropping rotation, you know, help help me management disease? I'm going to say that has limited impact. Um, it definitely can. You know, we don't want to be in a system that's growing, you know, legumes on legumes, all susceptible crops. But we also can't get our rotation long enough to really help drive that sclerotinia out of the system as they're viable in the soil for many years. The next would be variety selection. I'm going to say this has limited impact as well. You know, we know some varieties are more tolerant than others, uh, but we definitely don't have true resistance in dry bean either. So we can think about product placement, and if we know we have problem fields, you know, we can identify varieties that may do a little bit better there, you know, but they're not going to solve our problem. Then we have managed fertility, you know, and or moisture. Um, I'm going to say this has moderate impact. You know, if we keep our nitrogen rates where they need to be, you know, that's definitely helping us manage disease. Uh, if we have irrigation, you know, that's a, a definitely a secondary tool there that can be hugely important, uh, but also can create a big problem for us too if used inappropriately. Uh, so limiting that, you know, leaf wetting time period that we have, you know, and, and only utilizing as necessary. And then we have protective fungicide applications. I'm going to say that's moderate to, to high impact when available. Um, and then the questions always come up of product and timing, which we'll just share some brief information on. So we do run a fungicide trialing program here in Michigan. Uh, this year we ran three separate trials uh, in Montcalm County under irrigation. 
Uh, we do utilize Viper Small Reds for these trials as they're a fairly susceptible variety and also popular. Um, we have all applications were made at 22 gallons per acre and 60 PSI planted in 20 inch rows. So we'll just breeze through this quickly, but we have yield in pounds per acre, you know, zero to 4,000 pounds per acre. And there are different treatments, you know, shown here in box plots. And I like to show these in box plots just to show kind of the variability that you'll get in some treatments um, as the size of that box is kind of directly correlated to how much variability you had in that data set. Uh, for all treatments here, we did have two applications. So your first application is at R1, you know, when you have one flower per plant um, on all your plants out there. And then you have a secondary application at more of an R3 that's, uh, you know, typically guys will say seven to 10 days after your first application. To give you guys an idea of what our disease pressure was here and our untreated, we had 81% infection. So pretty strong infection in your untreated, you know, that's represented by your purple box here that yielded about 3000 pounds to the acre. You know, this was a uh, heavily focused on, you know, Propulse and Delaro type products. And then your next boxes, you'll have Propulse sprayed at six, eight, and 10.3 ounces per acre, you know, so applied twice. So the interesting thing you'll find there is across those Propulse treatments, we did not see a response to rate um, when two applications were applied. So a six ounce rate was just as good as a 10.3 ounce rate, you know, when we were going in a two application program. Then our two boxes to the far right, you know, looking at different uh, Delaro tank mixes um, or Delaro programs. So the first one, Delaro followed by Propulse, and the second one, you know, Delaro with Luna Privilege followed by Propulse. Uh, we did not see a yield benefit from either of those programs. Um, and I'm after a few years uh, of looking at Delaro, I do believe we're picking up a little bit of a, a phytotoxic response from Delaro, and those beans aren't quite able to overcome that injury. So kind of a, a different twist on, on fungicide programs and something that, that I'm interested in giving my you know, footprint and variety testing um, is varietal response to management and in particular fungicides. So we put out a, a quite large trial this year planning on May 31st. Uh, we put dual on pre because we couldn't get a field cultivator there to incorporate it uh, due to a location and some logistic issues. And unfortunately, we had a very heavy rain come through once those beans got emerged. Uh, so we mentioned earlier about that crop safety is better with a PPI versus a pre. You know, we got a lot of splashing um, when that dual was put on pre, so it wasn't incorporated. It was laid right on top. Um, and soon as those beans emerged, that rainfall put a lot of that dual up on those bean leaves, which you see a crop response to um, and burned those off. You know, typically those beans would grow out of that. You know, they're they're ugly for a week to 10 days and typically they get better. Unfortunately, that wind storm I mentioned earlier with our 70 to 80 mile an hour winds came through about the time those beans should have grown out of it. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we had to replant that trial a little bit later than anticipated and a little bit smaller entry list than anticipated. Uh, but due to that, you know, we had a lot of space to fill. So it's a really highly replicated trial where we really focus on black beans, you know, Blackbeard, Spectre, Adams, Nimbus, and Black Bear. Uh, but we also included one navy bean as well as HMS Bounty. And then essentially half these replications received a fungicide application uh, with some foliar uh, fertilizer include, included that were uh, a manganese and zinc product. And half of the replications did not receive anything. Um, so they did not have that, that fungicide application. So if we look at those two factors, you know, combined over each other. So here you have just varieties, you know, combined over whether they got fungicide or not. Uh, you'll see that Spectre, our red box here, was our top performing variety in this trial. Our lowest performer was Black Beard. Um, this trial, I would say, in our untreated, had about 65% infection for white mold. Uh, so mold was present in that trial, which this would explain this difference we have here. You know, Black Beard is one we mentioned earlier, can struggle a little bit more with disease, where Spectre typically does a touch better. Uh, so when averaged over, you know, Spectre was our top performer, Black Beard was our bottom performer, and then the rest of our varieties kind of fell right in the middle across Adams, Nims, Bounty, and Black Bear. When we look at our second factor of fungicide, uh, so this was once at 10.3 fluid ounces, bag advantage to that fungicide application versus the untreated. Now we'll get to the interesting part of this where we actually look at interaction, you know, how the variety 
and fungicide, you know, work together. You know, was that similar across all varieties or was it different? Uh, and what we found in two years of testing this is we have had a significant interaction, I meaning those varieties do not respond all the same. Um, and really to make it simple, Spectre has been the variety that has really been, you know, driving this interaction um, as it's had the, the largest response to fungicide. Um, this year, over five bags um, compared to that two bag average. Um, so it is interesting to see that our most tolerant line to white mold disease is also our most responsive to fungicide. Uh, so definitely uh, an interesting topic that we're, we plan to continue researching in future years. So then we'll move on to anthracnose. Uh, and these are a little bit simpler uh, topics to cover than white mold. Uh, we'll go again through that list, uh, focusing on rotation. You know, rotation can have really high impact on anthracnose. Uh, if we start with clean certified disease-free seed, which is always our recommendation as anthracnose is a, can be a seed-borne disease, you know, our, our next biggest impact is rotation. Where we run into issues in Michigan with anthracnose, typically is when we have a situation that was dry beans on dry beans. For whatever year, it did not get rotated to an alternative crop the next year. So we still had dry bean crop residue out there. We planted dry beans into that field, and then we end up with uh, anthracnose infection. So if we can get that into a good rotation, you know, typically that uh, is not an issue that shows up. Uh, variety selection can have high impact as well. You know, we have some lines that are genetically resistant to our endemic races, uh, which it is important to know what your races are is because those can be different, you know, from field to field. Um, but that can definitely have high impact. Uh, another thing that we can look at is managing fertility and moisture. I'm going to say that's moderate. You know, excessive moisture doesn't help, uh, but uh, I think we have other things that we can look at. And then once again, protective fungicide applications can have high impact, uh, but it can be a little more, more challenging. Um, and just to, to lay this out, we ran an inoculated trial a few years ago, you know, comparing an untreated to just one application of a product called Preaxor at four fluid ounces. If we look at percent infection, our untreated was at 100%. Where we made one application of Preaxor, you know, we were closer to 25%. And if we look at yield in our untreated, you know, we were about 17 bags to the acre in our untreated. Where we made that one application, we were close to 27 bags to the acre. But the biggest challenge about anthracnose is knowing that we have an issue before it's too late. Uh, you really need to be on top of it, and that can take really intensive field scouting. Um, and this can be an issue that, that becomes larger than larger than you can manage uh, very quickly given the right conditions. And then our last topic we'll cover would be bacteria. Um, this has been a, an issue that we mentioned ha, has shown up more and more in the state of Michigan. Uh, once again, we always want to source disease-free seed, uh, but that does not mean that these bacterial diseases are not still present somewhat in our environment. Um, I'd say once again, rotation has a high impact. Uh, we really want to avoid dry beans on dry beans for any reason uh, to keep that rotation intact. Uh, variety to selection, I'd say, is somewhat undetermined. Uh, we're, we've launched a few grants, hopefully uh, getting some future research to help us understand how tolerant some varieties are or are not uh, to our different bacterial diseases to provide better information for our growers. Uh, fertility and moisture is quite difficult, um, and our protective fungicide applications are, are highly variable on whether or not you know, we do have a, a response or not. I'd say regardless of that, you know, our timing definitely needs to be preventative when we talk about bacterial diseases. And then the last topic you know, we'll touch on is harvest aids. You know, some people that are new to dry bean production, this can be the, the most intimidating conversation we have with them, um, and it's you know, specifically for conventionally produced dry beans. Um, and this is the use of a herbicide to, to help, you know, deal with variability across the field to even up our maturity, you know, preserve our quality and, you know, have a, a timely harvest. Uh, we do have multiple products that are labeled for this, uh, but extreme caution does need to be taken in regards to application timing. Uh, these labels need to be followed like all labels, but is especially important here as we can see, you know, extreme penalties and yield and quality um, if applications are made too soon. And if we wait too long, you know, we can lose that benefit that we could potentially have from the use of that herbicide. Um, also in today's marketplace, we need to be extremely conscious of any potential uh, residues that we would have in a product. So we need to make sure we follow rates and timings uh, to a T. You know, our pre-harvest interval on these products can depend on three to seven days, you know, depending on the herbicide choice and label. 
And in adverse conditions, so usually we're talking cloudy, you know, high moisture, chance of rain, and cold, uh, we have found that tank mixtures often, often outperform uh, independent active ingredients. Uh, so one that's very common for us would be a tank mixture of uh, cefluphenicil or Sharpen um, and Gramoxone or Paraquat. Um, given those tough conditions. But if we get into falls that have really bright sun, good temperatures, we're going to have good desiccation of weeds and beans that dry them down, you know, and allowing for a good high quality harvest. Then one last slide to kind of summarize, you know, for dry bean production, you know, we can often uh, at times, uh, you know, state that we have a small toolbox, but really our, we have more tools than ever before for dry bean production to help us improve it. Uh, you know, we can look at doing things like improving our drainage, you know, as conditions allow to lessen our variability. You know, look at varieties from more of a product placement standpoint. You know, maintain our soil test levels, you know, but don't be afraid to draw from that bank when needed. Um, and is to bring home again that, you know, pushing fertilizer rates and dry beans does not improve our balance sheet. And more times than not, it can, it can push us the other direction. And foliar fungicides are showing to kind of pay more times than not, you know, as we're seeing that response in years of low fun, low disease incidents, uh, you know, we're still seeing that benefit from that product. Um, and some varieties are showing more response to others, you know, so it kind of brings us full circle to the idea of product placement once again. And as always, you know, think about that disease triangle, you know, when we are planning these applications. And if you're missing a portion of that, you know, we, we don't want to be thinking about making that application. And with that, I'll kind of conclude what I had for today's session and uh, take time for any questions if we have time left. We do have about five minutes. Um, while people think of questions, I'm just gonna share one final poll as well as the QR code to get um, CCA CEU credits. <clears throat> Can folks see that screen? Yep, we can see Perfect. it. Perfect. Um, I can jump in with a oh, question. Oh, sorry. Nope. Scott, looks like uh, Jonathan's wondering um, any names or links um, for the Dakota and Ontario trialing programs you mentioned? Yeah, so uh, Ontario, I'm usually looking at uh, the Ontario Bean Growers website, uh, so obg.org, or maybe that goes by Go Beans. Um, now, that's a great resource out of Ontario. Um, and then in North Dakota, there's uh, there's quite a few good resources out there. Uh, Juan or Sorno uh, would be their breeder if we're looking at you know more genetic things. And then uh, Michael Wunsch uh, works out of, I believe it's their Carrington station of uh, pathologists that really focuses on uh, more of the pathology side of things um, and, and fungicide programs. Great, and uh, maybe we can bring back Rodney's question from earlier about uh, root rots and whether you recommend um, any biologicals or mustard cover crops to mitigate that? This is in organic systems. Yeah, so I personally don't have experience with the mustards. Um, we've tried multiple different uh, biologicals over the years. Um, we have never seen a, a real benefit from them, not to say that there isn't, because I, I tend to believe that it's more of a, a long game we're playing, you know, with topics like soil health and biology. You know, it's tough to, to throw a product out there and, you know, expect something right away to show up, you know, in your in your yield column. Um, but personally, we have a relatively limited uh, experience and or success. Great, thank you. And a question about um measures for controlling deer yes so uh, you guys must have deer over there too that's uh it's been uh, an increasing issue for us especially in our northern regions of production um we've done some different things looking at uh some different uh products one that comes to mind was called plant skid um, and we have seen some efficacy to them you know they they definitely do work as a repellent 
Um, the issue that we at least observed is that the, the residual did not last a super long time, um, especially when we got into periods of frequent rainfall. Um, so if we made an application and it stayed dry for two weeks, you probably get a, a decent amount of benefit out of it. Uh, but if you sprayed today and then it rained for three days, uh, we seem to seem, see much more limited uh, efficacy of that repellent. Very interesting. Um, uh, Michael is wondering about different levels of um, herbicide and fungicide sensitivities among market classes. Yes. Um, <laughs> And there, there's, a, there's a lot to that question too, um, especially when we get into herbicides. Uh, the first one that comes to mind is like pursuit. You know, we mentioned we don't use a lot of it, uh, but we do know that as a general rule, our small seeded market classes are more sensitive than our larger seeded market classes. Um, so if we plant a, a variety trial that may have five or six varieties across it and pursuit was used pre, um, we can expect more crop damage or crop response on those small seeded mark classes than our larger seeded mark classes. Um, and typically we haven't noted that in fungicides, not to say that it doesn't exist, um, because when we work across you know 12 different uh, market classes and then you have multiple varieties within those, uh, it can be quite the research product to, to project to look at each of those different products. Uh, but we do know it can happen, um, especially when we work with different uh, you know, companies that are looking at releasing a product targeted at dry beans. We definitely encourage them to, to look at you know, not only multiple market classes, but multiple varieties before they do release. And um, a question I had earlier uh, was, um, so for organic growers looking for direct harvests, systems, obviously they have to cultivate to manage weeds. Do you have um, recommendations for kind of optimizing that uh, in terms of cultivation practices? Yeah, so that's always a, a difficult one and it can be done. You know, and a lot of times it just means that that knife height's going to have to be a little bit higher than we'd like it to be and you'll have some level of harvest loss. Um, which, you know, we can look at, you know, varieties, you know, definitely you want to focus on varieties that are more upright than less. Um, sometimes uh, a set of vine lifters on the combine can actually help pick up those beans above the ridges a little bit. Um, they're not always the, the most fun to take on and off, but uh, they, they can be beneficial from that. Um, and some of it is kind of day by day too, um, you know, making sure that, that header, you know, the pitch is adjusted correctly uh, to do the best you can without picking up those dirt clods, you know, without wearing off that cutter bar, you know, running in the soil uh, and having high, you know, FM in that load. Um, so it's, it can be done, but it is a little more challenging, you know, without that, that benefit of the, the rolled surface. Great. All right. Well, I think that is all of our questions and we're at, <laughs> 30. Um, Ivy or Heather, you want to add anything here? I Did somebody ask the questions about using contans? Have you had much experience with that, Scott? Yeah, yeah. So that's a good question, too. And, and we've looked at contans and, and similar to other biologicals. We've never looked at them long term, um, which I think is a kind of hole in our uh, scientific approach to that. You know, all of the protocols we've worked with were, you know, we're going to make a fall or spring application of contans, plant the dry beans, and look to see if we had a response that year. Um, and all of those trials, we never did see a benefit. Uh, but, you know, to my understanding, if you looked at a systems approach to that, you know, and looked at actually driving that inoculum level down, I would, I'd have more faith in a, a long-term response to that product, uh, which we have never actively looked at. Great. That's great. I was curious too. Thank you. I think that was the last question. <laughs> Cornell did a study on contans. That's what Rodney Graham is saying. <laughs> Sarah might know about that. Sarah Pepperberry. So. Um, so Heather, I haven't done any contans work in New York, but in Australia, we had 10 different trials and we were only able to demonstrate a benefit in one of them to white mold suppression the next year. And I don't really have a good idea on why that was in terms of the fact, the successful factor. But. Yeah, 
I, I just see Rodney saying he was a participant. Maybe he can right. un oh, okay. unmute himself if you know how, Rodney, and you can tell us. I don't know who yeah. did the study. But. Was it um, Helene Dillard and Keith Waltrip? Anyway, we'll have to have to dig that one out. Yeah, <laughs> that was really Miles. interesting work, Scott. It was great. Well, thank you. Thanks for uh, everybody uh, being here today and always appreciate the chance to meet new uh, new bean folks. Right. Thanks, Scott. And uh, sounds like some of us will see you in New York. In yeah, hopefully see weeks. you guys in a couple of weeks at your can opening. All right. All right. Well, that concludes our webinar. Thanks, everyone, for coming out today. And uh, We'll be offering more dry bean outreach and education, as you can see, and we look forward to having you all join us again. Thank you.